Hello everyone, good afternoon. Um, I hope you're well, uh, forgiving well as well as anyone can at the moment. Welcome to uh, Thinking on Sunday with Conway Hall, uh, currently Conway Hall in Exile, uh, which is at James's flat in another place in Liverpool and in my shed in South London. Uh, this is Conway Hall in quarantine. We're continuing Conway Hall's long-standing uh, series of talks on ethical and philosophical topics. Um, during the next lockdown and just basically hiding out since coronavirus first hit us. Welcome, hope you're well. Um, before we introduce James, um, just let you know how these online events go. Um, we Our speakers speak for about 45 minutes or so. Um, and then we have a live Q&A. So if you have a question for James uh, about his talk, do please type it into the chat box um, or the question and answer box in, in Zoom. And we will then ask you to, or offer to open your microphone so you can ask a question directly. There's, we always have a lot of questions for these, so please keep it as brief as possible. Um, we also have a hashtag if you're ever tweeting persuasion while you're uh, listening to the talk. So uh, if you can tweet, if you do have anything to say about this on Twitter, do use the hashtag thinking on Sunday or at Conway Hall so we know what you think and you can let us know. Um, and we would love to hear from you. We'll be finishing up hopefully around quarter past four, half past four, seeing how, seeing how, how your questions go. Um, it's good to see you. Um, so this afternoon we will have a talk on. Um, I suddenly forgot the title of Simon Moscow with James Rogers. Um, apologies, James. James writes books on international affairs, especially armed conflict. He has completed postings in Moscow, Brussels, and Gaza for the BBC. And he has a lot of experience from working in the former Soviet Union and um, in other fields. Um, this talk will be recorded today, so you will refer to it afterwards. But um, Without any further ado, really, do please welcome James Rogers to uh, Thinking on Sunday. Um, let's give me some imaginary applause for a moment. Welcome, James. Thank you very much, Scott, and, and thank you very much uh, for the invitation. Uh, and thank you to everyone who's decided to uh, to join this afternoon. Uh, I'm, I'm going to uh, illustrate my talk this afternoon with uh, a few slides. So I'm just going to put. Uh, those up on the screen uh, now so that I can just give you a bit by way of illustration uh, while I'm talking. So uh, this is the, uh, the the cover of the book which I'm going to be referring to this afternoon um, and this is a photograph of the battleship Aurora uh, in St Petersburg which um, played a key role in the second of the Russian revolutions of 1917 and it fired the shot, uh, which was the signal for the Bolsheviks to start the uprising. At least that was uh, the way that legend has come down to us. However, it wasn't that straightforward for the people who were reporting it because earlier that year, no news from Petrograd yesterday ran one unpromising headline in the Daily Mail on the 14th of March 1917. But of course, there was plenty of news from Petrograd. Tsar Nicholas II had just abdicated and by the end of the year, the Soviets would be in power in Russia, building the foundations of a system that would come to be one of the forces to shape the 20th century. The outside world could learn little though because the telegraph had been cut off by the provisional government and the correspondents in Russia's imperial capital were as frustrated as that daily mail editor on the other side of Europe. But days later, their thousands of words made their way across the wires and filled front pages. It was while covering a story in St. Petersburg in 2006 and it was the reburial of the Tsar's mother, Maria Fyodorovna, otherwise known uh, as Princess Dalmar of Denmark, that I first started to think about the historical tradition that I, as a foreign correspondent in Russia, was part of. I imagined the excitement and danger of reporting that revolutionary year and I determined to learn more about the experience of my predecessors and their work. I'm not going to talk at length today about the coverage of the revolution, although I do cover it in detail in the opening chapter of the book. Instead, I'd like to focus on the way that three episodes of 20th century Russian history were reported in the Western media. And those are the show trials of the 1930s, the Second World War, 
and Russia's first post-Soviet decade, uh, the 1990s. Now, I've chosen the first uh, because of the way in which I will argue it informs contemporary debates on facts and truth in politics and the media. And the latter two, because I've seen them as the eras which have had the greatest influence on contemporary Russia's image of itself. And all of them, I think, raise very interesting issues of journalistic ethics. Um, I'll also offer some personal reflections on my experience as a journalist of writing about Russia since the early 1990s and make the case for journalism, especially the reporting of Russia in a world where journalists increasingly seem to be under attack and where some are even killed for their reporting. But in the 1930s, it was the members of that Russian revolutionary generation who were themselves on trial, accused variously of plotting to kill Stalin, of making plans to sabotage Soviet industry, and of working with foreign agents. The leading likes of the Bolshevik move, move, movements were tried and in most cases sentenced to death. Uh, and this is the building in Moscow where those um, show trials uh, took place. Um, and they were really uh, shows as much as trials. And it was, it's very clear uh, in the way that they were presented. And Grigory Zinoviev, one of the accused, one of that generation of Bolsheviks who eventually was sentenced to death, said uh, during the last words that he was given in the court case, said, I know that every word pronounced here is universally broadcast. He was referring to the microphone into which he was speaking, radio then being the medium which dominated international journalism and communication. Newspapers, of course, still tremendously important, but radio was that new medium that enabled this simultaneous transmission of informa international information and that the power of the human voice as well. So it was very important uh, to the Stalinist authorities to make the most of the media as they could, as I say, very much show as well as trial. There was absolutely massive press interest. That doesn't, it generated dozens of articles, as you can probably well imagine. The big ethical question, of course, is should they have covered it in the way that they did? Should the correspondents have covered it in the way that they did? Because, of course, by doing so, they were taking part in this system, as I say, which was show as much as trial, and they were contributing uh, to the propaganda element of the trials as, the, as they unfolded. But I would argue that, yes, they should have covered it because of what it said about contemporary Soviet society and also because of the nuanced way in which they did it shows that they knew exactly what was going on. Um, Fitzroy MacLean, um, who was then in Moscow as a young diplomat, uh, in his memoir Eastern Approaches, I think he's said to have been one of the first members of um, Foreign Office staff who actually volunteered to go to Moscow. It was never seen as a sort of cushy posting, but he went there out of great curiosity. But he quotes um, Alfred Thornton Cholleton, better known as A.T. Cholleton, that was his byline for the Daily Telegraph, who summed up that whole murderous process when he was asked um, if he believed the evidence uh, and his epigrammatic remark has been repeated in, in a number of memoirs. McLean reported it, repeated it, Malcolm Muggeridge repeated it when he wrote his own memoir many years later and published it in the 1970s. And Charlatan said, when asked if he believed the evidence, oh yes, he said, I believe everything but the facts. And his witty reply, I think, shows uh, a nuanced understanding of what was going on. Um, and if you read the reporting, you know, closely as I have as, for the part of the research in my book, it's very clear that the correspondents understood that this was political process as spectacle. Uh, and even basic facts which were set before the court and accepted by the for courts were, were completely untrue. I think there are real echoes here of the disinformation era uh, in which we live now. But the correspondence by reporting this, yes, of course, they took the ethical risk of being complicit in the way that these uh, people were being treated on these often absurd charges. But actually, in the way they reported it, they demonstrated that and knew that. And in doing so, told their audiences, their readerships outside the country, something very, very key and important about um, what was happening in Russia in the 1930s. Um, the correspondents also were very, very close to the story. They were personally involved because, of course, those of them, those of them who had been there for a long time had known some of these people when they were the leading lights of, of the new regime. One example, Karl Radek, a uh, Bolshevik propagandist who had 
been left to deal with foreign correspondents and to explain things to them uh, in the 1920s, uh, it, because of course, right throughout uh, their time in power, even if they were wary of the foreign press, they still knew they needed to, them to get their message out. Uh, and Karl Radek was among those accused at the show trials. He was not sentenced to death, but he was um, sentenced to 10 years in jail and he died just a couple of years into his sentence. But to show how closely um, some of the correspondents felt their, their relationships with these people, Arthur Ransom, who of course is now much better known, has become much better known to posterity as the author of children's books, he was a correspondent in Petrograd uh, around the time of the revolution. And he recalled, um, he later wrote of Radek, talking with him was like, for me, like revisiting the Latin Quarter. So cultured did he find Radek's conversation um, uh, on account of his extensive knowledge of literature. Um, and it was actually because of the way these show trials operated, not only was Radek sent to, to jail, but so was his daughter, Sonia, um, whom Ransom recalled playing with uh, in, um, in Radek's Kremlin apartment when Sonia had been a toddler of a couple of years old. So really, really sort of close relationships there uh, in that sense. Um, so quite difficult to, to see these things unfolding before them. Now, Charlatan, whom I just mentioned before that, had been there since 1921. So by the time of the show trials, he'd been in Russia for a long time, um, you know, 15 years plus, and had a very good understanding of the way that the country worked. Uh, and he'd been there, for example, during the time of um, Marguerite Harrison, who, whom I write about in the book, a, a very interesting case. Marguerite Harrison um, had wanted during the First World War and towards the, the early period of uh, Russia's revolutionary period, had wanted, she was American, to go to Europe uh, as a correspondent. However, in those days, her gender prevented her from doing so. So the, she took the opportunity which did present itself for her to go in the guise of a journalist, and that was to go as a journalist, but in fact to be spying for American military intelligence. Her memoir is remarkable for the way that it describes her crossing um, from Poland illegally into what was then uh, Soviet Russia, uh, and being surprised by the fact that she's able to make all but unimpeded progress all the way to Moscow. Only later, uh, does the penny drop and she realizes that the Soviet agent in New York had known exactly who she really was, had tipped off his masters in Moscow. And so she found all this accommodating assistance uh, because they wanted to keep an eye on her. So she has remarkable access, she gets to meet Trotsky, uh, but of course this is because they want to, to watch what she's actually up to. And I think the big, and, and, and this of course raises a huge ethical dilemma. Um, should you go as uh, a spy while pretending to be a journalist? I would say certainly not, although I think there are mitigating circumstances for Harrison, given that she wasn't permitted to sign up as a correspondent on account of her gender, and she, her writing shows that she was an extremely talented journalist. Um, but of course, what she was doing in those times, and she did end up in jail herself, um, was uh, she was putting all other correspondents um, in danger too by her activities. Charlatan and also the, the other big episode of the 1920s I want to refer to before moving on uh, is that of um, the famine in um, Ukraine in the early 1920s. Uh, I'll talk in a little bit more. I'll refer later also to the famine of the 1930s, but it was during this uh, famine that the Soviets were first obliged to ask for outside assistance, something which we were, they were very reluctant to do. And in order to do that, um, the Americans, as a condition of aid, asked for some correspondence to be admitted. And at that point, uh, most of the Western correspondents had been um, expelled for Russia, from Russia, or those who wanted to enter Russia um, had great difficulty doing so. So a lot of them were in Riga um, on the Russian border. And it's a, it's a measure of the importance which um, the Soviets set by their relations with the international press, that they actually sent um, Maxim Litvinov, who was the Soviet Commissar for Foreign Affairs, you know, the equivalent uh, of the foreign minister to negotiate in person with the correspondents who, inc who included uh, Floyd Gibbons, um, a remarkable character who did succeed in getting admission to Russia and did go to Ukraine and wrote some heartbreaking stories about 
uh, what he found there. He was a man of striking appearance because he had lost an eye when covering the First World War and so, um, and also had arrived by a plane which he had and he said to Litvinov, if you don't let me in, I shall simply fly my plane in because I don't think you'll dare to shoot down an American plane. It's, it's, it's striking the way that he deals with um, the Soviet officials in a very high-handed manner. He actually refuses to give them his passport to look at because he says, and he justifies it in his writing by saying, well, if I give them an American passport, they will simply copy it and, and use them for spying. So he, he's, he's very bold in his dealings with them. But again, um, that was the famine of the 1920s. Of course, a much more infamous episode is the, is the bigger famine in Ukraine uh, in the 1930s, which um, some of you in the audience may have seen the recent film, Mr. Jones. Uh, which talks about Gareth Jones, the young British writer who did manage to get there and to report it when uh, the correspondents in Moscow uh, were refusing to do so. And of course, history has come to judge uh, most harshly uh, Walter Duranty of the New York Times, who was fated as a great correspondent in his time. But because of his refusal um, to acknowledge and to report the famine, uh, remains a controversial figure to this day. Um, to the, in the sense that the Pulitzer Prizes, which he was awarded uh, in the 1930s, you know, in 2003, 2004, there was a big debate uh, in America about whether he should um, have those posthumously taken away from him. He, of course, denied that there was a famine uh, in Ukraine and preferred to use the phrase widespread malnutrition, which is a little difficult to, uh, to distinguish the difference there. But, um, and the reason was that he wanted to maintain good relations uh, with the Soviet authorities and realised that writing about that famine would almost certainly uh, lead to his expulsion. Um, so I think they're another massive ethical issue uh, and one in which those journalists in Moscow who decided to take that decision and follow Duranty's lead, uh, a, a, an ethical issue from which they um, emerged with nothing but shame. Um, so that after the 1930s, I want to move on now to the, to the, to the Second World War or the Great Patriotic War, as it is known um, in, in Russia. This is um, some people who visited um, St. Petersburg may recognize this. Uh, this is um, some of the masonry uh, on the Evsky Prospect, the main street in St. Petersburg, which they have, the Soviet and now the Russian authorities have maintained uh, because it shows the damage that was done by some of the shells. Um, during uh, the siege of Leningrad, as you can see on there from 1941 uh, to 44. Uh, and, and it says that the figure there refers to uh, the number of shells, a very precise number, which uh, the Soviets have calculated uh, were fired at Leningrad during that siege, 148,000 plus. So this was, a, this was an interesting moment because of course, at the beginning of the Second World War, there was a Nazi-Soviet pact uh, and the correspondence from Western countries were kept very much at arm's distance uh, until that um, Hitler's forces attacked the Soviet Union in the summer of 1941. And then of course, Britain, America and the Soviet Union found themselves as allies against Nazi Germany. And at that point, a few correspondents were allowed into Moscow. Among them, Charlotte Haldane, the first British uh, woman correspondent to a report from Russia, Philip Jordan, Charlatan was still there, uh, Alexander Wirth um, and Cyrus Schultzberger of the New York Times were among them. And they're all kept from the front line uh, until an episode uh, in September. And I'm just going to read a brief extract from the book here uh, to talk about um, how, what, how, how that, what the experience was of those correspondents who were permitted to go. Um, the six day tour for the foreign press through recently recaptured territory was well planned. The Soviets had organized this because they'd suffered some, they, they'd enjoyed some military successes after the German advance. What was not planned was the air raid on the town of Yasma during the tour. The correspondents were roused from their beds by the sound of explosions. There was a thud and the little hotel shook from head to foot, wrote Haldane later. Not that she was complaining. In Moscow, I had never managed to get within miles of an air raid incident, but here I was more fortunate, she continued. She and Margaret Burke White, to whom Haldane refers as Mrs. Caldwell, she was married at the time to the writer Erskine Caldwell, uh, went out into the street to see the damage. She saw a family of four who had all been killed in the raid. An old man with a chest wound, she feared he would not survive. 
was being carried away on a stretcher. What a magnificent work, morning's work for the Nazi bombers. Cyrus L. Schultzberger for the New York Times filed a dramatic account of his experience with the raid, with everyone hitting the floor like frogs leaping into a pond at the approach of danger as bombs blasted all the windows out. Charlatan was more composed, writing of the loss of life and property among the town's residents while we had merely our windows blown in. The story then took an unexpected turn. Later that day, their Soviet handlers told the correspondents that the crew responsible for the raid had been shot down. The correspondents were invited to watch the interrogation. Their accounts reflect something which later British and other Western correspondents covering armed conflict have barely known. The experience of reporting on a war in which your own country is directly at risk. One of the German crewmen, it turned out, had earlier carried out bombing raids over London. Charlatan's report seems strangely sympathetic. He realises that the young man, the radio operator, might be exercising caution because there were known to be Gestapo gangs among the German prisoners, gangs who beat those whom they felt had said too much. He was certainly no Nazi, Charlatan concluded. Not everyone was so generous. Worth hated what he saw. Perhaps witnessing the destructions of towns and villages in the country of his birth hurt him personally. The, those German airmen he had seen were certainly disgusting specimens of humanity, he wrote in the next edition of the Sunday Times. Commenting on the captives' so modest social origins, sons of a butcher, a janitor and a tailor, Schultzberger wrote that their words sounded like the latest editions of a Nazi propaganda sheet. Haldane, not long out of London, where she had also worked as an air raid warden, wrote that it was the navigator who had taken part in the attacks on the British capital. I remembered the corpses of mothers and little children, she wrote, I had inspected as part of my duties in St Pancras Mortuary. The fact that Haldane's memoir was published the following year, rather than like the news reports in the hours and days which followed the encounter, did not make a difference. Time did not soften her opinion. I could not see any hope in a civilised world for such as he, she concluded. And I think it shows really there the personal nature of the reporting and the way that they were so deeply involved. It must have been deeply distressing and clearly it angered Haldane that she had been working as an air raid warden and seen those terrible things such as the, the civilian corpses in the mortuary in St Pancras uh, here in London uh, and then had seen, met face to face uh, one of those people who were responsible, one of those things about 20th century war and the possibilities which are offered really for the first time of killing at such a remote distance. Um, and in late 1943, um, shortly before it was finally liberated, Worth was actually able to report from Leningrad, uh, where he had been born before his family um, left at the time of the revolution. The city which came to symbolize Soviet suffering uh, as, as Stalingrad did soldierly sacrifice. But before going on to describe the children whose parents had starved to death during the blockade and the shells which had landed this, and, and the 1500 shells which he said had landed in the city the day before, Worth reminded listeners that this was his hometown. That may have clouded his objectivity and I think that's one of the big issues about um, the covering of the Second World War. Um, but I think it helped him to tell the story. And I think I, I want to just uh, move on to consider the situation um, when he reports from Stalingrad later on. This is one of the buildings um, in Stalingrad, it was a flour mill actually, which was, it's been left now. The city um, above ground at least was all but flattened during the battle, which lasted uh, from September 1942 until February 1943. And the Soviet um, authorities left this here as a, as a kind of memorial of, of the extent of the destruction that the city had suffered. Because however suspicious they were um, of foreign correspondence, the Soviets knew when their own propaganda purposes would be served by giving them some of the access which they craved. And that trip to Vyazma, which I've just described was an example, and allowing access to Stalingrad in February 1943, once the famous victory was won, was another. But what a story everything tells here, Worth wrote. And his dispatch that day combined first-rate eyewitness reporting of the city, entirely flattened by bomb and shell, 
and he, he talks of one little wooden house that's all I could find of normal habitation in a town the size of Manchester and he also incredibly um, in the same way that correspondents were allowed to see the uh, German air crew uh, in that town west of Moscow they were also allowed to see the uh, German field marshal and some 20 generals who were captured at Stalingrad and Worth describes them saying um, he describes the generals, he said, with their monocles and iron crosses and new Nazi decorations behind lock and key, they radiated venom. Um, that moment of common purpose between the Soviet Union, Britain and the United States did not last. And there was some improved access for correspondents in the 1950s. But the Cold War meant that correspondents were um, viewed with great suspicion. Uh, and they were generally greatly restricted in what they could do. And the BBC, uh, one of the things I did for my research was to consult the BBC's uh, internal archives and their internal memos. Um, the BBC had a debate in the 1960s about whether they should send a correspondent at all because they were just thinking, you know, it's going to cost us a lot of money. Is a reporter there actually going to be able to get any, um, actually going to be able to get any information? So what they do as part of this decision-making process is they talk to um, American correspondents who are passing through London uh, to try to find out, you know, talking to them to find out if it's worth their trying to send a correspondent to the Soviet capital. And one of those meetings with Stanley Johnson's um, of these Associated Press reflected the corporation's perceived influence in the Cold War era. And the notes from this lunch, uh, Johnson suggests, that the BBC correspondent would probably be considered the next most important British personage in Moscow after the ambassador. Um, it wasn't like that when I was correspondent there, but maybe it was obviously very different times in that sense. Uh, and the correspondent's wife, his wife, and there was no question then that the correspondent would be a man, uh, Johnson suggested would lead, need at least 15 cocktail dresses for all the receptions she and her husband would be expected to attend. Um, but there was warnings against, uh, there were warnings against the living conditions there. Uh, there was a warning against uneatable, uh, yeah, that's the word which is used, you think someone from the Associated Press or maybe it was a BBC note taker was not aware of the word inedible, which is a perfectly good word in the English language. That uneatable food which uh, apparently stank, so there's a warning about the food supplies. Um, but in a reflection of how sensitive such conversations were seen and how controversial, that memo that the, the note about the lunch meeting and uh, like another one with um donald connery of time magazine were both marked confidential in the bbc archives and this was um the time of course of the cold war this the uh, the iron curtain was there an ideology very strongly divided east and west but again the correspondents in that era were allowed to celebrate soviet triumphs um when Yuri Gagarin became the first man in space, uh, Robert Elphick of Reuters saw oranges on sale uh, in Gorky Street, which is now called Tierskaya in, in the centre of Moscow. The Soviet authorities would often make available for sale or, or for distribution goods which were hard normally to come by. Um, obviously, oranges being among those at certain particular certain times of year um, and so that was this was how they celebrated they would make these these foodstuffs available. Um, Elphick uh, himself was posted to Moscow uh, in 1958 um, the earliest first hand I was account of being correspondent in Moscow that I was able to include in the book. Um, I interviewed him about 18 months ago and very sadly he has since died uh, but his stories will I, I hope live on and, and it was a very memorable phone conversation sadly uh, his health then didn't permit um, our meeting face to face but his family has since told me that it was the last interview which he gave and he, he really was uh, full of life and full of remarkable stories and only one of which I'll share here. Um, at that time, of course, when he first went, um, Western correspondents were subject of quite strict censorship and they had to take their material to the Central Telegraph office to be seen by the censor before it could be transmitted to the West. Uh, and this is a fairly sort of stony faced encounter, as you can imagine. But Elphick said, the only joke I ever came across from the censor was when one of my American colleagues talked about Khrushchev, then the, the Soviet leader, and he referred to Khrushchev as one of the greatest men in the world. 
uh, Alfred told me, and they said, but the censor sent back the copy and changed it to the greatest man in the world. So this was, they weren't going to let them away with just being one of the greatest men in the world. Now, the formal censorship ended in 1961, although that ended some years earlier, if you were a correspondent from a communist newspaper, but there were still many restrictions. And a lot of the memoirs from the 1970s, even when there was no formal censorship then, um, there was very restricted access. And so um, Hedrick Smith, for example, talks about train journeys as being one way of getting to talk to ordinary Russians in a, in a way that was normally difficult for a lot of correspondents. People seem to be more relaxed on train journeys and Jonathan Steele, Steele from The Guardian told me the same thing when I, I talked to him for the book. Now, of course, ordinary Russians is, we can't be certain that it's, it's, you know, the, the people who are able to sit next to or sit near or talk to foreign correspondents may of course be you know, invited to share the, the, the contents of the conversation with the authorities afterwards. But I think it is true to say that the correspondents seem to sense that there's something of the sort of transitory nature of meeting somebody and, and anyone who's traveled to Russia will know that long distance train you know, journeys which can last days are still a very common way of getting around. So it may just be that that sort of, that sort of friendship that grows up on, on, a, on a journey like that was a very good way of correspondents getting to talk to people. But from the mid 1980s onwards uh, was an incredible time for foreign correspondents and Gorbachev, Mikhail Gorbachev, the then the new Soviet leader, was using the Soviet press um, to help him to promote his own um, reform program, using the Soviet press to help him against the conservative elements in his own party. And of course, the international press um, benefited too. Uh, and even the most imaginative reporter could hardly have wished for a more a dramatic year than 1991, which saw a failed coup against Gorbachev uh, by uh, hardline Soviet elements, and then, of course, the collapse of the Soviet Union itself. So this is um, a photograph from that summer of 1991, which was the year I went on my first assignment. And I, um, I teach journalism uh, at City University of London, and I show my students this when we do a lecture about reporting societies in revolution. And I ask, you know, what do you notice about this picture? And of course, the point is that uh, you can still see the Soviet red flag flying uh, on the roof of the Kremlin later that year. And until this day, it was replaced by the, by the Russian tricolor. So I think there's three things that stand out um, above all others from the reporting of the 1990s. The events of October 1993 that I'll talk about in a little while, the wars in Chechnya, and the challenges for correspondents of telling the story of ordinary people living through the extraordinary times they were ex experiencing and doing so in great hardship. Um, this photograph uh, was taken from a flat where I lived um, in the centre of Moscow uh, in the autumn of 1993. You can see the colours of the leaves. And the interesting thing about this for me, um, what had happened was um, the then president Boris Yeltsin had had a long standoff against the parliament uh, and eventually he tried to dissolve the parliament, they refused to go. He surrounded the parliament building um, with police. The parliamentary faction um, had some armed elements too and then eventually, and it was, a, it was a really important learning experience as a correspondent, I think, of people covering revolutions, large scale civil unrest within what there was a there was a demonstration there was a celebration on the Saturday afternoon I think it was a celebration of an anniversary of Moscow and from but then there was also a demonstration against the way that Yeltsin was acting towards the parliament that broke into some sort of disorder people started throwing things at the militia as the Russian police were then called and within 24 hours uh, it had gone from disturbances in the aftermath of a political demonstration to an all-out shooting war in certain parts of Moscow. This photograph was taken on the Monday lunchtime, so perhaps 48 hours after that. And you can see that there's some tanks in the middle there. Um, and you can see what, what was remarkable for me was the way that this was really 20th century, 21st century war. Uh, the wars that we've seen in recent years um, in Syria, for example, where they just take place in normal cities 
with the civilians around. Uh, and these people had just um, decided to come out. It was a nice afternoon. Nobody was really going to work because nobody knew who was going to be in charge of the country by tea time. And so there they were just wandering around. And these tanks were being fired upon from the other side. There's that, you can just see at the back, there's a wall there. That's one of the embankments of the Moscow River. And the tanks were being fired. It was an extremely dangerous place to be. Um, but it was, it was, it, it was, it, this all happened very, very quickly. And it's, it's a real challenge for journalists to try to capture that, just the way that something that goes from a, a demonstration can turn into a shooting or in such a, a very short space of time. That, though, had started a sort of trend of violence in Russian politics. Uh, and it was only a little more than 12 months later that Russia went to uh, launch its first military campaign against the separatist. Um, region of Chechnya in the south of the country in the Caucasus Mountains. And that military campaign began in December 1994. And this is what the centre of the main city in Chechnya, Grozny, looks like uh, in April 1995. As you can see, uh, no buildings habitable and a lot of them absolutely flattened. Um, Jeremy Bowen, the BBC's correspondent who, who covered that conflict, later wrote that uh, it was by far the most violent place he'd ever been. And obviously he's covered wars all over the world. Um, and I think there was a couple of lessons to take from this one. Um, the first was that uh, in the first war, this was the first war from, which lasted roughly from 1994 to 1996. And then there was another one from 1999 to 2000. In the first war, the main limits on correspondence traveling was just really how brave they felt or how their sense of danger or safety and um, it was very strange and unusual experience in reporting armed conflict because you could talk you could cross front lines which is normally impossible but on this occasion you could if you you know you knew way around ways around you could talk to uh, Russian soldiers and you could talk to the separatist forces who were fighting them all within a matter of hours so that was a very unusual experience the coverage concentrated to a very large extent on, a, on two things. One, the extensive civilian casualties, and two, um, the, the ineffective nature of the Russian military operation. Probably in consequence of that, by the time the second war came round, the restrictions were placed on, uh, on correspondence were much, much stricter. Um, I'll come on to that in a moment. But the other thing to, to tell here was that, um, it was it, it was extremely dangerous and it was it was it was really um, the other thing to reflect upon was the limits of journalistic power. Uh, and a lot of journalists, particularly young journalists, I was then I think imagine that if you go to a story and tell the story of terrible things that are being done to innocent people as the civilians uh, in this city very largely were. Then something will happen about it. Nothing happened upon this occasion. Uh, and, I, and I came to the conclusion that you would only get sort of government intervention where there was a pre-existing political will. In that case, journalism can put pressure upon governments to act. But looking at the bigger picture from that time, it was only four years since the end of the Soviet Union and the end of the Cold War. And it was quite clear that Western governments had no easy solution to this and did not want to act against a Russian government, which they saw as friendly beyond the confines of normal diplomatic criticism. So it was a, it was a, it was a it, it was a harsh example of the limits I think of journalistic power. And by the next war, this is a photograph taken in early two thousand. Um, you had to travel with the Russian army. Um, I'm grateful, by the way, to Andrew Wilson of Sky News for permission to reproduce this photo in the book. Uh, we're travelling there um, on the top of a Russian armoured personnel carrier. It was the only way that we could go into actually to see Grozny, uh, and we had to do so with the with the Russian army, which obviously um, limited what we could do. Uh, and there was an extensive danger of kidnapping then too, uh, not Lee, and, and of course of, of attack. I think the biggest question, though, of the, of the 1990s, and I'll just move on to my sort of concluding section now so that we've got time for, for discussion, um, was the effect that people of people suffering really a collapse of all the certainties that they've known, people not getting their wages paid, and when their work wages were paid, they were very quickly worthless because of the galloping inflation. And I think the big ethical challenge for that, for, to, for a journalist, was a lot of things. I remember one story where we went to do um, reports upon uh, 
I produced a, a, a long report for Newsnight on BBC Two about, um, they just wanted us to tell something about the Russian economy. So you're given this opportunity uh, to try to get that abstract idea and to tell it in concrete terms. So we went to the city of Rostov-on-Don in Southern Russia, where there'd been one uh, big factory making uh, agricultural equipment, but uh, because of the state of the Soviet economy and the fact that we're now obliged to compete with um, Western technology that was in most cases more reliable and more advanced, their orders had dried up to a large extent. A lot of their potential buyers were in any case broke because of the terrible financial situation in the country. And they had sold some combine harvesters to um, to a, Bel to a Bulgarian company similarly reeling from the effects of the collapse of their planned economy and the Bulgarian company had not had enough cash to pay for them so they had sent them a consignment of jars of pickles uh, to help to pay for it so the people in the factory in um, Rostov were not getting paid in cash one of the men, men that we featured in our report the only cash that his uh, family had coming in was his mother-in-law's meager state pension but apart from that, you know, we spent an afternoon with him, we saw him at the factory, and then we saw him at his little dacha, his little sort of allotment, really, where he was growing the fresh fruit and vegetables that was their main source of food. And the ethical challenge for that for a journalist, obviously, you know, you could, you know, an unscrupulous journalist could say, you know, look how hilarious this is, people getting paid in jars of pickles in a part of the world that produces loads of pickles anyway. But I found it absolutely heartbreaking. And, I, you know, this man was in his 40s, uh, and, you know, had worked well at a professional job and had you know really was was um I mean, he was he was determined not to let these things get the better of him but he was in a desperate situation really and the ethical challenge i think there was to make sure that you always showed these people the utmost respect in your reporting and to try through your journalism to offer them a certain dignity which you know the, their circumstances had frankly stripped from them so that was a very sort of challenging time i think but, you know, there was little access to the political elite then for us, you know, uh, us Western correspondents, and it was very cheap to travel. So those were the stories that, you know, we would go out to try to tell. And then many cases, there were insights, I think, which were denied to policymakers. And I think, uh, but we knew that what was happening in Moscow was only part of the story. And although, um, you know, I, as somebody who, who spent a long time in Russia and, and first went there in the 1980s, uh, obviously I'm saddened by the situation of relations between those two countries. Um, uh, and, and while I don't think many of us who were there then would necessarily agree with um, some of the aspects of the direction that uh, the country is now seeming to follow uh, under President Putin, I think uh, we did all understand why after that chaotic decade, people were very willing to um, elect a former KGB officer as um, president. You know, one word that you heard people craving for when you went on your travels was the Russian, it was pariadak, which means order in Russian. They weren't even necessarily saying we don't want law and order, we just want order, you know, in a society where wages weren't being paid. Um, and it was very, very difficult to get anything done. And I think that was really, and that's one of the reasons why I've chosen to focus on that at some length this afternoon, because I think it is one of the episodes which has really helped to shape uh, Russia as it is today. But as I say, we were able to travel. Um, this was said uh, something else. This, this is a, a photograph from a, a film I made for um, BBC World uh, quite a bit later. This was in 2009. It was about climate change in, in, in Archangel in the north. I'm happy to ask more, answer some questions about that in the discussion. But the reason why I've chosen this was this road was used uh, to take timber out of that forest, which normally they can only do in the winter because it's, it's not surfaced roads. And in the summer, it's muddy and marshy. Um, so they do most of the taking the timber out in the winter when it's hard frozen but when we were there I was there for about a week making the film and the temperature on one day was minus five which is remarkably warm for northern Russia for that time of year a couple of days later it was minus 35 and then a couple of days after that it was plus five again it was minus five again so very very difficult to deal with and I remember the man who um was in charge of this forestry showing me that part of this road was not actually frozen and this was in February when it should have been you know, absolutely rock hard so climate change again something else that they were very much dealing with uh, and to conclude now I want to talk return to um, talking about an episode of the uh, Second World War this is um, 
from my, my trip to Volgograd, where, of course, the site of the Battle, Battle of Stalingrad, where I went uh, in the spring of last year when I was finishing the research for the book. And this is something I want to talk about, the influence of journalism and, and the printed word in armed conflict. Um, um, if anyone reads Italian, I, I can understand a little bit, but you can probably see what this is, says. Italian soldiers, um, and it's criticised because there are Italian troops with the Germans that are fighting at Stalingrad. And this big uh, caption in bold says, why have you come here? So this is propaganda that the Soviets were dropping on the Italian lines. You see all these miserable people trying to survive in a, in a blizzard, trying to undermine their their morale. Um, but as I say, a visit to Volgograd in the spring of 2019, um, while I was researching and writing the book, was a reminder for me of how Russia sees its own story and the West's role in it. Because if in Western Europe we have tended to see, and, and our journalism has often portrayed Russia as a large threatening land to the East, then I think in Russia there's an opposite view where threats have come from the West in the shape of Hitler and earlier in, 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 of Napoleon's forces in the 19th century. And in addition to this military aspect of Russia's story itself, there's another strand of more recent history um, that still casts a long shadow, 1991 and the end of the Soviet Union. And that's why I chose them to make the points I've been making this afternoon. Um, there's, uh, and right, but one of the key points I want to get across in the book is because relatively few people from the West have been to Russia. The journalism that covers Russia has had a key role in explaining all of that, and, and Russia has always also sought to influence it. And I hope, um, in the book I try to argue, and I hope I've conveyed a little of that this afternoon, to try to argue for a more nuanced understanding of Russia and for a journalism that crosses borders and cultures in a world where they seem increasingly to try to close themselves off, uh, pandemic or not. So um, thank you very much for listening and I'll be happy to take your questions. Thank you, James. Um, yeah, I don't, I'm not sure we've got any questions at the moment. Um, I think everyone's been listening very intently. Uh, S. Vaughan has just raised their hand. S. Vaughan, I hope you understand that we can open your microphone so you can ask your question directly. So we're going to try that. Unmuted. Can you hear me? We can hear you. Uh, great. Uh, fascinating talk. And I couldn't agree with you more in terms of the, the additional role of understanding historical context for journalists these days, uh, no matter which country they're in. Mm. Uh, my question about Russia to you would be, um, it's an enormous country. And given the improvement and enhanced uh, variety of communications and media these days, how is it able to maintain or maintain the perception of uh, governmental unity across that amount of space? For example, Nalvani was focused on the east, the very east of the country. And mm -hmm. I'm wondering if you have anything to say about uh, differences in perspectives that are growing throughout the country. I think that's a very interesting question. I mean, it's been a big challenge for Russia's rulers right throughout history. Um, I mean, it was always, it's always struck me as a strange idea that Peter the Great, for example, built his capital. You could hardly go further west in Russia, almost, in St. Petersburg. And he was obviously trying to, you know, to link the country um, to the west more. But in the present day, I think it is a big issue, as you rightly say, you know, Navalny, um, I mean, I think... Navalny's strategy is partly because, um, and I think The Economist made this point in a recent report, the middle classes of, of European Russia, of Moscow and St. Petersburg, are into, you know, there are large sections of them which are pretty disaffected with the current administration. And I think Mr. Navalny thinks if he wants to spread his influence, he is needed uh, to go to Siberia. People will no doubt have seen those protests in Khabarovsk and very far east, a long way from Moscow, um, which have continued for weeks over the, the situation around the, the local governor there. Uh, and of course, you know, mentioning Mr. Navalny, his future is going to be very interesting. Um, is he going to try to return to Russia? And I think there is a sense, um, there was a very interesting move, I think, which passed to an extent unnoticed a couple of years ago. Um, when uh, the presidential administration created a whole new layer of regional governors, um, young, mostly men, relatively young, experienced technocrats in their 40s who were sent out to the various regions of Russia 
I think with the with the view of trying to consolidate the Kremlin's authority there greater, because I think the authorities in Moscow felt that it, it, it was in, it was in doubt in some parts of the country. If you think about the very size of the country, um, you know, I remember going to the Arctic coast on the very far east. You know, you're and you're there. You're east of Hong Kong, and you're just across the Bering Strait from Alaska, and it's twelve time zones ahead of London. You know, we really are on the other side of the world, and yet, you know, Moscow still very much feels and looks and is geographically part of Europe, and that is, you know, very much part of Asia, really. Thank you. Okay, thank you, James. Um, so, if you do have another question, do please. Um, raise your hand or type in a question or stick something in the chat. Let us know in some way that you've got something to say. Um, and while we're here, I want to put a quick plug in for another talk we're putting on Russia, uh, which is on Monday the 9th of November with uh, Nina Yankowicz, who has published a, war, uh, a book about the information war with Russia and what we could do about that, essentially. If you go and look on the Conway Hall website, there will be uh, something on there. Um, and Anita Tim Timmons, I'm going to open up your microphone. Hello, Anita. Oh. Hello. Hi. Hello. Um, thank you for your very interesting talk. I've been following Russia for a very long time uh, from a Baltic angle. Um, mm -hmm. I agree that the uh, I was in um, uh, uh, Omsk uh, about five years ago. It's about the last time I've been there, and uh, talking to people there, I made the mistake of calling them Russians, and they said, oh no, we're Siberians. Yeah. Um, I, I wanted to ask you really, and this is perhaps asking you to speculate wildly, but where do you see things going now? You've got a lot of experience. Um, I see that, if I'm calling it right, some people are being arrested in, in uh, Belarus this afternoon again. Um, I just wonder where you see Putin's uh, future, um, and really sort of continuing issues with, with reporting in Russia. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, I think that's a very good question. I mean, a lot of people um, in the audience will no doubt have seen that this summer um, Russia held a referendum, which in theory would permit um, President Putin to stay in power until 2036. At the moment, he's supposed his current term expires in 2024. Uh, the constitutional amendments which were passed by this referendum would allow him a further two uh, terms of uh, six years each, taking him up to 2036, by which time he'll be well into his 80s. I um, have said I, I write a comment on uh, Russian affairs for, for Forbes, the American business magazine, and the piece, the piece I wrote after that. Um, I, I, I'm of the opinion that Mr. Putin needs some new ideas if he's going to continue. And I think actually the fact that he's had to do this you know, I don't think there's any question of the extent of his authority, apart from, you know, what we've just been saying, there are, there are questions of it in certain areas. I think I can't see him being, you know, replaced in, in the near future. But I do think that those policies which he's had, which have guaranteed his popularity and which have demonstrated his skills as a politician and understanding his constituency, I don't think, and I would put them broadly into two categories, one of which is improving people's living standards and two, which is, um, restoring some perception of Russian glory abroad, by which I mean the annexation of Crimea and Russia's military intervention in Syria. But I don't think that military campaigns abroad um, are going to guarantee future popularity. I think that, that that approach has been tried. And I also don't see prospects for um, returning to the growth of the, the, you know, the people's personal, the improvement in people's personal economic situation that was um, a consequence of those rising oil prices in the 19 in, in the 2000s so i think um i mean i was asked on the radio on a podcast i was on the other day if president putin would still be in power in 2036 and i don't think he will be i think um but i think one weakness of the system which he's created in, in building that sort of order from chaos in the after the 1990s is the system is entirely reliant upon one person and if he can find the right person to succeed him I suspect he will probably do so, but I think if that were obvious, he would have probably done that one. I think I suspect there may well be a part of him which would quite like just to to uh, to move on. But at the moment, the way that things are, he's obviously judged that that's not possible for him. So I think uh, it's going to be very interesting in Russia in the next few years, particularly as the country, in common with every government around the world, deals with the huge economic and social effects um, of the pandemic and, and how their countries are going to look like after that. Thank you. Thank you. That's, um, I was going to ask something similar to that, James. Um, yeah. 
and well, I, I think Anita's covered it really well. Uh, just coming on from the, yeah, the, and from the other the talk we're having uh, on the 9th, um, yeah, the future of Russia, you think that uh, Putin isn't going to remain? I mean, how is he, how is he seen, this is what I'm thinking, how is he seen by um, regular Russians? The impression I've always got that he is a hero to the Russian people and he's the per person that brought order. Is that... I think that's true. I mean, although, I, I, and let's not forget, you know, the, the respected um, polling organization, the Levada Center, which, you know, it, which regularly conducts surveys of how, you know, polit political leaders are seen. Their last um, set of figures that, um, that I saw, which was, I think, it's probably for August or September, suggested that Mr. Mr. Putin's approval rating was about 59%. Now, I think that most um, political leaders in the West would be pretty happy with figures like that. Mm. Um, the point about that, though, was he had as recently as 2014, 2015, enjoyed approval ratings of, of, of 85 percent, which is striking after he'd been, you know, 15 years after he first became president. That was the consequence of the annexation of Crimea, which definitely worked uh, in terms of um, you know, it led to extensive sanctions from the West because it was a legal seizure of somebody else's territory. Uh, but it certainly um, worked well. You know, it, it played very well in terms of domestic political opinion. Uh, so I think, but I think, I, and I did put this to, you know, a couple of people, you know, officials in the Kremlin and when I was there in the 2000s, when it was quite clear that, uh, you know, there were some irregularities in, in elections. And I said to them, you know, I, I, and I put the question to them, you know, privately. Said, "Why do you bother doing this? Because you know, President Putin, Vladimir Putin, would win a fair election anyway. So why bother to rig them?" And to which their answer was, you know, that they were concerned about, you know, the Parliament getting big extremist elements in if they had completely free. Uh, one of them said, "You know, if we did that, we would have a Parliament, you know, that would be a third full of communists and fascists. So we can't afford to sort of take the risk on that." But I think he is genuinely popular. But I mean. And certainly was and still is, as those figures would tend to suggest. I mean, uh, I'm not sure what the approval ratings for any of the, you know, the, the leaders of Britain or France, etc. are at the moment. No, nowhere near that, I don't think. No, um, not. So I think, you know, that is, but he is genuinely popular, but but not to the extent that he was before. And I think people are wondering, you know, Russian incomes have been falling in real terms for seven years. So that deal that he did, which was in effect, a reduction of political and press freedom in return for rising living standards. It's no longer working. So that's why I say I think he's got to come up with some new ideas. OK, well, I don't think we have any more questions. Um, I, one thing I'm curious of is you've spent a lot of time in Russia. How, how do you feel about the country and the people itself? It's, um, it's such a vast, mysterious place to someone like me. I've never been. The nearest I've been is um, Estonia. Um, how do you feel about the place and its people? I find it endlessly fascinating, as, as people have probably gathered. I mean, there, there are bits of it that I've, I find tough, and, and I've seen some, you know, some quite bad sides of it in terms of, you know, the the, the conflict that I've witnessed there and the, the the deprivation that I saw in the in the after the end of of communism. I, I am endlessly fascinated by Russian culture. Um, I, uh, you know, I love the literature. Uh, I've tried to learn to understand a bit about ballet as too while I was there. I did, you know, I made the effort to do that. Um, the variety in the country, you know, from palm trees in Sochi in the south to, to the Arctic regions. Um, and I think that probably the most amazing place I've, I've ever been really um, was when I went to Chukotka, which is that bit I mentioned right over on the far side on, on the east coast I mean, when we went there in um, December 1998 and um, I remember going to one place that it was a sort of Soviet dream to sort of conquer the Arctic so they built European cities in these polar regions and you would see but because the economy was sort of contracting <clears throat> you would see sort of housing estates that, like the kind you see at the outskirts of any European city now you know there's a couple of blocks of flats right nearby you know, where I'm sitting here that could well have been, you know, there that had been abandoned and had snow drifts sort of building up the side. Um, and we went to somewhere where um, the sun didn't come above the horizon between mid-November and mid-January. It, 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 it went light for a few hours in the middle of the day, but you didn't actually see the sun mm. for two months. And I think, but and yet they built this sort of industrial society there and it was just such an amazing 
sight to see and seeing those abandoned blocks of flats was a bit like seeing Roman ruins now you can see there was a great power here once but it's not there anymore and it was really really interesting I've always found um, Russian people can be a little forbidding in sort of initial public situations yeah but I've also found that you know once you you make friends with a Russian you have you have a very good reliable friend I mean it's a big sort of cultural generalization but it is sort of quite forbidding in initial for um official situations and that can be it's a cultural difference it takes something to get used to but um i've always found you know living and working there a very rewarding experience brilliant thanks james and um, we do have another couple of questions in so um first of all norman backrack your microphone's open yes hello Please, norman lovely to hear, hear from you Yes, uh, you began your talk by talking about the Stalin show trials in the 1930s, but I would like to hear more about Lenin. Um, you didn't, apart from showing one picture of him, you didn't mention him. Um, to what extent was he responsible, the way he ran the state in, in the early years, for it, its becoming a totalitarian state? Was this entirely due to Western interventions, trying to put the regime out of business, of course? And to what extent was it an inevitable, in your opinion? I think that's a, that's that's probably a question that uh, you know, an academic historian who'd made a great extensive study of, of it would, would better answer. And I think a number of them probably wouldn't agree on the outcome either. But um, it's a very good question, Norman, and I will have a stab at answering it. I think, um, and what it is striking, I mentioned Arthur Ransom earlier. Arthur Ransom clearly was a great admirer of Lenin. He got an opportunity to uh, interview him, you know, and he talks in very admiring tones about seeing him speak, as indeed did John Reed, you know, the American journalist who famously wrote 10 Days That Shook the World. So I think in that sense, you know, he was very aware, you know, in the areas of my research, he was very aware of the importance of, um, of, uh, of engaging with with the West or with the international community through the Western press, um, and of course, you know, opinions of what responsibility Lenin bore or otherwise for what came later. Um, I think when you look at, uh, I mean, a lot of the research that was done, there was a, there's a very good book um, by a Soviet historian. It's published in 1991 when a lot of archive material was made available. That really, um, and of course, there's been some people who've always argued that you know Lenin had the vision and, and didn't live long enough to carry it out and Stalin sort of spoiled what came later and it is true to say of course that Lenin was suspicious of, of Stalin um, becoming too powerful after uh, he had died but I think um, I don't think it's my conclusion and I get it, and many people would disagree with me I don't think that the Soviet Union could probably have ended up any other way than it could, um, being founded on those Marxist-Leninist principles. And I think that was probably, you know, the Gorbachev son doing in the 1980s. He was a true believer in this sort of more human side of Marxism-Leninism and tried to reform that which unfortunately proved not to be reformable for, for a number of reasons. And so I think, I suspect, um, and I know a lot of people disagree with me, but I think um, the the system's Leninist roots made it inevitable that it would turn out uh, like it did. Okay, and you're the person here giving the opinion, James. So um, we've got one more question from uh, S. Vaughan, and um, I think, and we'll call it an afternoon, I think. Hi again. I, I Hi. deeply appreciate your, your knowledge of the country and your experience. And the question I have relates to something at the moment uh, Russia depended initially so much on its oil product mm -hmm. for a part of its economy, and that was sinking long before the COVID problem came along. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, so I'm curious about its adventurism in the Middle East all of a sudden, and whether it doesn't seem to me outright to be something that would uh, go in the, in the direction of re uh, reusable energy, um, it doesn't, it, all it seems to be is perhaps a, an effort to uh, claim some sort of diplomatic clout in replacing the Americans. Uh, what do you see as the main motives behind th these moves? Yeah, I think that's a really good question. I, I think that the last part of your, your question, I think touches probably on, on, I think that's the, the way I would probably interpret it. If you go back to 2015, uh, when Russia launched its military campaign in Syria, 
I, I think there's an interpretation of what Russia did, which, which runs along the following lines. They saw that there was a policy vacuum, that the West was not acting on Syria, and they saw that they could. And I think principally, it was about two things. It was about um, sending a message uh, to domestically, politically, and saying, and it was one thing that I think that um, the Russians wanted to say, we are reliable allies. They've been very close to, um, President Assad and indeed to his father in the Soviet times there was tens of thousands of Soviet military advisors um, in uh, in Damascus during the Soviet period and I think what they wanted to show was if one of our allies gets into trouble we will help him and so we're going to help uh, and of course whatever one thinks of Russia's military intervention in Syria it has been the determining factor it has determined the survival uh, of President Assad's administration when that was definitely in doubt four or five years ago um, and I think so it was about that and it was also um, about saying domestically firstly you can rely on us as an ally and secondly you know we are calling the shots in the Middle East now in the way that you know the United States and its allies might have thought that they did um, in the early years of this century in the, the last decade of the last one and previously but now we, we're saying we are back on the international stage we are you know and recalling the days um, you know of the Soviet Union as a superpower I think that's what it was uh, in those terms the oil price is a very very important one the Russian budget uh, is balanced and every year when it's published it says the figure that you know we need the oil price to be at this much and they've been pretty smart about that because you know they've seen the way that things are going although obviously you know this summer Nobody ever foresaw. I think there was. Well, I'm, I think I'm right in saying there was a, a few days when oil was technically uh, negative in price because yeah. there was nowhere to store it. So yeah. clearly, you know, those days. I, mean, I remember when I was in Moscow uh, in the last decade, instead of 2006, 2007, shortly before the 2008 financial crisis hit, oil was at 147 dollars a barrel. So you know, if you're one of the world's biggest oil exporters, you can see that's got huge. Um, you know, benefits for your budget and for everything. So those days are gone and, and it's very hard to see them coming back. So Russia's probably going to have to, to think again on, on the extent of its reliance on, on, um, on hydrocarbons. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your question. Thank you, James. Um, yeah, thank you for that. It's um, Russia, the subject of Russia is like the country itself, vast and diverse and um, fascinating. So thank you, James. Um, Best of luck with the book and everything else with it. Um, thank you for coming to speak to us. Um, well, thank you very much for the invitation. And as I say, I, you know, I'd very much like to have met everyone in person this afternoon. Uh, I know that life isn't like that. Um, but I was going to say, and I, and I said this at the other talks that I've given, once I'm allowed to, I'll be very happy to organise a book signing. So if anybody wants to buy a copy of the book, then, you know, please I watch out my, my website, which I've got the address there. Uh, or on social media and I'll announce when I'll do that and I'll be very happy to sign it and to, to meet people and to answer their questions in person. And if anybody does read the book, um, or, or maybe some of you already have, then please do consider giving it a review on Amazon. But I, my thanks to, to Conway Hall and to Scott for organising this. It, it was um, I was very pleased to accept the invitation this afternoon. Thank you. Thank you, James. I'm sure we're, we're not done with Russia yet and Russia's not done with us. So we look forward to seeing you again. Thank you. And thank you to everyone. Um, keep well. We hope to see you virtually in some way in the future. So uh, thank you both very much for attending this, this afternoon. <sighs> Goodbye for now. Thank you.